Before we get started, just a reminder that you can find all of my available rental properties on my website at markguzman.com. If you own investment property, click on the owner services section to see our complete list of services. This episode and wine tasting is sponsored by Lanny Clark with Prime Lending. Lanny Clark is a loan officer specializing in residential home lending. He communicates with you every step of the way and his honesty sets him apart from the rest. He's able to think outside of the box due to his experience and is able to tailor a loan program to fit your needs. If you can't qualify just yet, not a problem. He will let you know what you need to do in order to be ready. Lanny is also backed by Prime Lending, which is one of the biggest and fastest growing lending banks in the nation. They have simplified the home lending process down to five steps. And FYI, step number five is to relax and enjoy your new home. So contact Lanny Clark today at 510-964-0620. Theater is one of history's oldest and grandest forms of expression. It can also provide a window into all new worlds and ways of life and give you the skills to tackle any challenge. That is what the Gritty City Repertory Youth Theater in Oakland is all about. Gritty City was founded on the principle of providing young adults in Oakland and the East Bay Area a safe place to grow into their lives and experience the world around them through the magic of theater. Today, our guests are Lindsay Krumbian, the executive director of Gritty City, and ensemble members Tomorrow Page and Jordan Lopez to talk about the impact that theater and Gritty City have had on their lives. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so let's, let's get started here. So welcome to the podcast. I'm excited to have uh, all three of you here on this uh, podcast and excited to talk about Gritty City uh, Repertory Youth Theater. Thank you. Thank you for having us, Mark. Yeah, and before we get started, uh, we're, we're going to be tasting here a Ghost Pine Chardonnay. Have either of you tried this one before? about five minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> I How, do take like a sip. <laughs> How do you like it? How do you like it? I like it. It's very refreshing. So I do want to give a shout out to Lanny Clark with Prime Lending. He is our wine sponsor, uh, one of the sponsors for the show. And so great, awesome home lender if you guys need one. Cool. Nice to know. So let's jump right into Gritty City. What is Gritty City and how did the three of you get involved? Well, um, I'm the founder and the executive artistic director of the company, and we opened seven years ago in 2012. Um, it's a youth theater company for 14 to 24-year-old performers of color in Oakland. And our mission is really about accessibility. Um, if you look at theater in general, it's, it's very white and very privileged, and we feel that there's a huge waste of talent when you aren't providing access to people from all kinds of socioeconomic backgrounds. And so basically by providing free and paid training, we're providing an opportunity for people to do rigorous intensive theater training who aren't going to go to, you know, a, a $100,000 conservatory program. Is that really how much some of these costs? Oh, there is. Yeah. Theater is so crazy expensive. And just even like theater camps are, you know, two grand for a month in the center. Wow. And they're super white too. So it's like, it's, you know, who are you training with? What is the content? Is it relevant? Is it, you know, culturally specific? Like, no, you know, so, so I think that we're providing access not just because of finances, but also an environment that that feels really good, that feels relevant, and and really doing theater that you're not seeing in too many other places. What's your background in theater, and what led you up to founding, co-founding in Gray City? Yeah, um, well, I was a high school teacher. Uh, for 11 years before I opened Grady City Rep. And um, I never did theater, actually. I, I was an athlete. I always did sports. And it's, you know, it's tough to do both in high school. And, uh, but I saw a ton of theater with my family and just always loved it growing up, um, primarily at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival up in Ashland every summer, which is 
just a really, really incredible theater with very high production values. And so I sort of caught the bug for the costuming and the sets and, um, and just the, the professionalism of the actors and the, and the wild Shakespeare comedy, I think, was what, what got me when I was a little kid, that you could do these crazy things and crawl around and hide under things and peek around things and, and just have the whole theater just rolling with laughter. Really, I think it's, it's where it all sort of springs from. And it's really so you got the, pr uh, the producer bug. I, oh, I do. Well, and I, produ I produce the show, so I do... Um, Costuming, I do sound design and all of the sound cutting, and I, I co-design sets and I, I build sets and I do, you know, like everything. Back there, <laughs> I wasn't the wig master in the last show. That Even was a little bit of acting, like choreography and yeah. So um, production didn't really interest me, but so I I, um, I started theater production programs at the high schools that I taught at because the schools where I taught never had theater classes or production, there were always schools, like Mission High School in San Francisco was the first school I worked at, and then there's charter schools in the East Bay. And, um, well, that's one thing that's very difficult nowadays to see is that you have so many schools cutting funding for many programs. Well, and art go first. Programs. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. first, right, yeah. and these are schools that didn't, didn't even have arts before things started getting cut, you know, I mean, or maybe, maybe many moons ago, but not any time recently. Yeah, and it's really sad to see because we've had some experts and psychologists here on the show that talk about the benefits of just simply taking a child and exposing them to so many different things, right? They might, they might be into sports or art or tech and coding, but you have to expose them to that in order for them to learn and then just realize that there's a lot more opportunities out there than what they're typically just used to. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. And it's so not just about becoming that thing, right? It's like, it's so valuable, just the training, the process, and the exposure, whether that ends up being your profession or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's absolutely crucial. So you're teaching high school to high school and realizing there's not a theater program in any of this. Right. And also just do it. So I was an English teacher and I was using a lot of theater in my classroom curriculum and really sawing seeing the way that it, it brought all kinds of students to life. Because when I was teaching at Mission, I had, you know, a really wide range of literacy levels in my classroom. You know, there would be kids who were barely reading all the way up to kids who were on a college reading level in the same class. So if you're a strong teacher, you do a lot of differentiation and you make sure everyone's challenged and everyone's supported. But that's hard. You know, that's a lot of different levels of curriculum happening at the same time. And I found Shakespeare was the great equalizer because nobody understood it. <laughs> so that was fun. And we never wrote about Shakespeare in my class. You would never write an essay about Shakespeare. We shoved everything out of the way. We put on silly hats and we did it. And I like your English class way more than mine. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, had an, I had an English teacher in ninth grade where we got into Shakespeare, but she did the exact same thing. She's like, we're going to... Everyone was going to read a line, and here's your roles. But literally, we got up, and she's like, act it out as much as you want to. Oh, yeah. you know, some people didn't want to act. They were just up there to read. But others got really into it. Oh, yeah. And sometimes the kids that get into it are the kids who maybe are really going to struggle with a more formal essay. Or they're really going to struggle, you know, just with some of their literacy skills but you you get them on their feet and then it's a different modality and all of a sudden you're seeing a different side of this kid and they're having success when they haven't had success before and it it just felt like a way to really bring lots of sides of the kids out and so then I thought you know we could do this more intensively and so then we started the after school program and did it ensemble based and so instead of auditioning for a play he would just audition to be part of our theater team, and then we would make sure everybody got cast in a role that felt like a good fit. And the training, we did a lot of really physical training, and it involved a lot of community building. And so I think the kids that participated were always sort of an odd bunch, you know, and I think that's still true. Yeah. You know, we don't have what you'd think of as sort of traditional theater kids. You know, it's not... It's not this sort of diva-y, like, 
look at me, kid, that you, you think of stereotypically as a theater kid. Um, every once in a while we get one, but they don't last very long with us. Um, but it, it was kids who... The quiet ones, the ones who are like to themselves like even when angel got there like right. theater jordan's, couple, like, brother, jordan's yeah. brother like when he got there he was like super quiet super shy like we went to go hug him and he just like stand in one spot like okay this is happening <laughs> versus how he is now he's super outgoing he's playing sports like hanging around a whole bunch of new people making different friends a completely different angel from how we met him in the beginning you know mm-hmm. you know i think it's a lot of kids who are just looking for something and want to get pushed and want to be out there and, and, you know, so there's really high expectations. Like it's a very challenging program and it always has been, you know, even when I was doing it in schools, I, I started programs at three different schools after school, you know, is high expectations. I mean, you better sweat, you better work, you better know your lines, you better be able to take it. <laughs> you don't because you're going to hear about it. But then people are also working for each other, you know, I think, because you know that if you're not prepared, you're letting down your fellow castmates. But if you are, that you're bringing up their level. And so I think they start to, you know, I'll let you guys speak for yourselves, but it seems like the longer you're around, the more it's about the group and doing, you know, what you need to do to bring everybody's level up. And then I think there's this feeling of community and social responsibility that's like the healthiest kind of peer pressure. There's definitely something to being a part of a tough challenge or a tough goal to meet where other people also depend on you and without you, you could you could make the entire thing a disaster. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it, it's very interesting to see people get put into those roles and really see them step up and and they become a completely different person from when they first enter. Yeah. That's got to be amazing to see. You're seeing that all the time with the program, right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, what would you say about just like the shift in confidence level? Well, um, I do remember Lindsay saying that if one person leaves, like we did this activity where we lean on each other's legs and just had the whole weight balance. If one person is removed, we all collapse. Everyone is just in the group. It's a very, it's really important, and um, just just showing up, even if you're not gonna um, like blocking your blocking yeah. scene. It's just having you there is important. Yeah. Why? Because let, let's say if someone is absent, we can use your body to block something, and then have that person come back like, "Hey, this is what you missed." Let's get it. Let's get it. You know, mm-hmm. um, just this, just um, the way I want to explain it to make it easier in terms. Just showing up gives like the whole vibe, brings that happiness. If one person's missing, we'll notice right away. Uh, what, what happened to that person? All these questions come up. And we worry, and as long as we get that information, oh, they're out running late. Oh, we're fine. Then we all start smiling. We're like, all right, it's gonna be a good day. So it's that community that you feel. Yeah. It started off when we started out, when we did the uh, auditions, we were like, who are these people? <laughs> okay, I, just like, you gotta do, you gotta get in there right away, no, right? Because yeah, the yeah. auditions are really physical, like you're, you're having physical contact with people, eye contact, you know, it's not for the faint of heart. Yeah, because I remember my first time, uh, you know, long hair, a beard, and I see all these little kids, I'm like, what am I doing here? <laughs> like, I'm a grown, I'm a grown man, all these little kids here, and I had to, you know, hug they're them. They're not little that. kids, they're all teenagers. Yeah, they're teenagers, but, but I see them as little because they're 16, 15, and I'm 20, I'm turning 22, so I see them as little because I work with middle schoolers and high schoolers, but, you know, as, as I got to know them, it's, there's no boundaries now. I just go hug them. I push them. I'm like, hey, come on, let's go. You know, it's just fun. I don't see them as younger people. I just see them as my group. Like yeah. peers. Yeah. Right. Squad. Yeah. Squad. So okay. so what year did Gritty City come about and where did the name come from? Uh, 2012. So I was, uh, yeah, you know, I took a, I took a year off teaching because, um, school I was at wouldn't give me a part-time job so I was like come back if 
a five week old full time or, or nothing, which didn't sound so good. So um, I left my job and was a little at sea for a minute because I really loved the school that I was at um, and decided, you know, I'm tired of building all these programs, but then sort of being at the whim of like other entities, you know, and not being able to control my own fate. And, and none of the schools I was at had ever provided a dime for any of this programming. Like I never got paid to do any of it. Plus I had to fundraise everything wow. myself, like everything, literally. I never got anything. I got to use a space, but that was it. So I thought, you know, what am I getting anyways? <laughs> I need, I need to be a nonprofit so I can fundraise for real and just sink or swim on my own seat. So I decided to sort of take the plunge and just do it as a community theater instead of through a school. And it's the best decision I ever made. Um, I had a lot of help. My, my mom is like this really amazing, amazing human being. She's just like great at everything and a total energy ball. And so she, I would never have been able to get my nonprofit status without her because it's really challenging. It's a ton of paperwork. It's really time consuming and very confusing. And I mean, I was an English major. I'm like the best reader I've ever been. Like, I don't know what they're asking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so confused. Um, and so she's just been a massive supporter in every way and, and really helped make it happen. I wouldn't have been able to do it. But yeah, so it took a year and got it going. And uh, yeah, Gritty City, you know, we're based in Oakland. And uh, it's a little more polished now. Well, yeah. it's still in construction right now, so things are still pretty gritty. But, uh, you know, the Oakland I've known is is definitely a gritty city, you know. Mm -hmm. A lot of edge, a lot of grime, a lot of art, a lot of mm -hmm. gut, a lot of heart. Um, and our performers are primarily from Oakland or uh, Hayward or Richmond or, you know, and didn't okay. grow up in gentrified Oakland, yeah. you know, grew up in Oakland, Oakland. And, um, you know, I think that our, our aesthetic is very much about like gut and not shying away from challenging subject matter and, you know, going to some tough places. So, yeah. How many people were a part of the community when you first opened it? And how many are there now? What, like in what sense? Like staff or performers or audience? Or, or both. Well, I mean, our first ensemble, I think, was maybe 12 actors. So for every, for every season, we hold auditions and some people stay. And some people don't, so we always have some veteran actors and, and some new actors for every season. So, since 2012, we've had 71 performers that we've trained, and a third of those have performed for multiple seasons. So, wow. I've stayed for um, two years, three years, four years, um, and two thirds have performed for one season, and then and then not continue, which is also fine, you know. I think it's, I mean, a year is a long time to commit. We're six hours a week of training. It's a big commitment. Um, what's, the, what's the age range as far 14 as? 14 to 24. Forms? So okay. you've got to be in high school and up to 24 years old. Okay. And pretty much we're about half and half right now, half high school mm -hmm. and half. Okay. Um, if someone was interested in getting some more information or even participating in becoming a performer, yeah. how would they... How will they um, get that process? Yeah, started? well, our website is www.grittycityrep.org, and there's information about auditions on there, but pretty much we always have an audition after every show. Yeah. Usually in the winter, we might add one or two people. Sometimes we don't actually have an audition in the winter, but every spring we hold an audition for the next season. Yeah. And so our show is in May. And the audition will be the Tuesday after our show closes, but it's all up on the website. You know, and people don't have to prep because most people that come and audition don't have theater experience. And so, you know, again, I talked about accessibility, right? So, like, if you have to prepare a monologue, you're already axing out a bunch of people, right? Who just, like, aren't going to do that because they don't, like, can I? What the F is a monologue? <laughs> like, I don't even know what the fuck a monologue is, yeah. right? I mean, a lot of our actors never had seen a play 
That was phenomenal. The if that was the criteria, I would have never been here today. Right. Right? <laughs> but, like, now you could deliver a million monologues. Oh, yes. Right? But so it's, like, it's it's who do you want in the room, right? So we make sure to set up our process in such a way that we're attracting the folks that we're actually mm -hmm. interested in working with, which are not folks that have access, really, to other programming. They're folks who heard about it through their cousin, or they saw a show because their teacher brought them to a student matinee, or they go to one of the schools where I go out and recruit and talk to teachers, and I'm like, who has that spark? Like, who, yeah. who needs this? Who needs the community? Who can handle the commitment? Like, who should try this? And then is there a cost associated? Or how no, does that work? No, not only is it free, we actually um, pay our so if you're... Over 18, if you're out of high school, you get paid 350 bucks a show, so 700 a year, wow. um, just you know from the jump. And then if you're in high school, after you've trained with us for a year, by your third show, you start getting paid 350 a show as well. Wow. Plus, we do paid apprenticeships. So, yeah. so like tomorrow is um, one of our arts administration apprentices. So she does stuff with ticketing and company management. She does stuff oh, with nice. social media. Yeah, so we also have tech apprentices. Um, we have a beginning tech program and then an advanced tech program. And yeah, no, we, we pay. <laughs> <laughs> they don't pay, we pay. <laughs> That's amazing. So not only is it a free program, but eventually yeah. they, yeah. they can get paid. Yeah. And actually, almost everyone gets paid now, which is yeah. like, <laughs> a I, lot. yeah, I've paid over four grand in stipends this past season because, like, everyone is staying now. We have 12 out of 15 actors are apprentices now. Yeah. So, tomorrow, how, let's talk about your apprentice, apprenticeship. Mm -hmm. How did you get involved with Gritty City, and how has that really changed you since you first started? A lot in a little, because um, I didn't start off with, because uh, when she was talking about the audition, I had already known Lindsay from years prior, because they, from high school, right? Uh -huh. From high school, and like he calls me one day, he's like, hey, sis, um, you want to do this acting thing? And I'm like, sure, okay, when do I have to be there? He's like, 4.30, I'm like, okay. So you know, I'm leaving from work, traveling to San Francisco, and I get there, and like I kind of, they instantly start rehearsing, so I'm just like, I'm not. Supposed and I'm staring at my brother the whole time, like, okay, he's doing that, so I do that. I don't know what's going on here. <laughs> it was very awkward and uncomfortable for me for a while, and it took me a while to get my footing. And the person who realized that I was good at was Lindsay. It was this scene from my first play, which was a Creole version of Macbeth. And I had, I had like little small roles, and then one of our actors had to leave because of a medical condition. So I ended up taking a bigger role on, which is a soldier. And I was like, I didn't know how to handle it, so I kind of do it. And I did, and from that moment on, she was like, you blew me away. From that moment, I knew, oh shit, you got something in you. I was like, I don't see it, but you see it, so that works. <laughs> <laughs> and from there on out, I've been, I've loved every single show we've done. Like, I'm terrified every single time I get on stage, despite what people might say or think from watching the show, but it's the audience and the reaction that keeps me coming back, it's like, they understand what I'm doing. Like everything I'm doing on stage explains itself. They see the story and they're following it the entire time. And the amount of joy I feel putting into it, that's what I get when I'm finally done. What? Awesome. So, well, and to, I mean, tomorrow is a phenomenal actor. You know, it's interesting. So she um, she's playing Kate in our upcoming Taming of the Shrew, and Jordan here is playing Patricio. So I don't know if you're familiar with the play, but they're the love interest, but she wanted to marry her sort of by force and tame her, and this is what's happening. But so we we just got into rehearsals a month ago, but when we were doing our table read, so this is a total cold read. Most of the kids don't know the story, just what they've heard from me. They haven't read the play before. Um, so we're just sitting around the table reading this script, and she's doing a, a scene with, with Jordan, and he's reading his lines, and she's making faces and looking over at him and oh, just totally reacting, getting every line. And I'm like, oh, you're going to be great. <laughs> you know, and watching that transformation from um, 
your first show was Macbeth. Yeah. Uh, where, you know, I would say initially you were very intimidated by the Shakespeare because Shakespeare's intimidating and you're not sure, you know, it's going to be hard and all that. And then just watching you. And since then, she was in Macbeth, a modern play called New World Disorder, and then Midsummer Night's Dream, and then Caught Up. And so right now she's in rehearsals for her fifth show with us. Um, Just watching how deeply she owns it now I think is just really exciting to see an actor just find her own process. You know, I mean, obviously we do a lot of training, but at some point, especially for the older actors, it's like, okay, I can give you line readings. I'm going to direct you. I'm going to block this scene. I'm going to adjust you, but you got to bring some choices. You like, you got to come with more than your lines, yeah. right? Or because it's a training program, but, and not all of them will go on to do this as a career, but some of them want to yeah. go on an audition and become working actors, you know? And so what we try and do is more and more like, well, you know, what's happening for you yeah. here? What's the backstory? How would you react to this? And I'm trying to be very cognizant as a director of sort of a wide range of actors, you know, experience level to be much more hands off with the older actors. And you guys notice that, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and just ask more questions and give more space for them to try things before I'm like, say it this way, go over here, do this thing. And of course there's still that, because you know, that's what a director does. But I think they're really starting to get their legs in terms of, you know, just ownership of their own process and their own choices. So that's Mm -hmm. exciting. Very interesting. Jordan, what's Gritty City for you? What's What's been the experience for you? It's been an amazing experience. Um, the first time I got to Gritty City, I was with Lindsay before, and she said that they were looking for actors, and she remembered that I was talking about doing an acting career during high school. So I auditioned. I remember it was I got there. I had a monologue ready. And <laughs> <laughs> I got there, and then... We start exercising. I'm like, okay, what's going on? Like, this is not fun. We exercise at, a lot. I look, I'm looking around. I see tomorrow. I'm like, oh, she's doing that. I'm going to do what she's doing. And then um, we got a sheet. I looked over it. Lindsay divided us into three groups, and we performed. And the veteran actors just sat there. They were looking at us because, obviously, they don't have to do it. Lindsay already knows how they are uh, working-wise. We finished. I stepped outside the building, and like two minutes later, Lindsay calls me, hey, you got a part. <laughs> <laughs> and um, ever since then, it's just an amazing experience. It came jobs, and we try to get there on time. And, you know, sometimes we do come out of work exhausted, but for me, I give 100% at work. I come here, I give 200%. Yeah. Um, I remember... Um, it's a grit, right? <laughs> yeah. For Gritty, uh, for uh, Midsummer Night's Dream, I had to play Nick Bottom, and this character was so energized. I will come out of work all beat up. I'm like, all right, I got to get hyper some way, because I got to play this character. And there were some moments where <laughs> it's like a psycho. Just um, back to the question, though, um, the experience is amazing. I learned so much about myself that I never thought I actually had. Uh, different abilities that I'm now realizing about myself. And um, one thing, if you go to Gritty City one day, and you pull out the actors individually and you ask them, what's one thing that comes to your mind when I say Jordan Lopez? I can guarantee you the first word that will come up is funny. <laughs> he is funny. I, I'm an amazing actor. They say that, but that's going to be the second thing they're going to tell you. The first thing is going to be, he's funny. I guarantee you that. Just I can make anyone's day. Like, I don't know how I do it. That's one thing I realized about myself, just joining Greedy City. It's that vibe I give off. It's true. I don't think I've ever seen say anything but a kind word to anybody honestly have you ever seen him like even give a look to even anybody? when he's tired he's yeah. just like he'll yeah. nap and then he's right back to yeah. gym <laughs> yeah. he's like pat- he gets there early and then he's just like passed out in the common area just like gearing up taking a nap but the minute we get started he's like right there ready to go yeah, I just hear the music oh that's my that's my cue now <laughs> I'm over here working out already <laughs> so Sam let's spin the wheel this is a new segment that uh, we're doing where we spin a wheel, we get 
uh, a topic or a question, and uh, we've had some uh, pretty fun results the last few shows with this. Topic of fortune. Yeah. yeah. Dream road trip. Ooh. So, Jordan, let's start with you. What's What would be your dream road trip? Well, I got my own car now, so I guess I can finally do the a dream road trip I had since high school. There's a lot of great places in California, Great Canyon, um, um, Yosemite Park, you know, places I've never been to. And those are really beautiful sites that I want to visit because I'm almost, my spare time, I, I do photography. And there are some places I really want to visit and take pictures of, but I can't because of my busy schedule. So just um, driving down California, Southern California, because we live in Northern California, just regular California, Southern, places I really want to visit. I've never been there. Um, you never been to LA? I've never been to LA. Oh, okay. Really? Yeah, I was like, I've never been to <laughs> Yeah. I tell that to people, they're like, hey, you ever been to LA? Nope. Okay, and they, yeah, they, they just look at me like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> and I tell them straight up, you know, I'm busy, I'm a busy guy. I do have A lot of people refer to, um, LA, well, to many parts as LA, like LA County, mm -hmm. but actual Los Angeles, most people just go there once. <laughs> Especially yeah. if you're from the Bay. Oh, that's <laughs> not LA. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because the people that tell me, oh, you never been to LA? You know, I'll go there all the time. You're lying, you just go to your auntie's house, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> that's not LA, LA. Yeah. But yeah, I would like to just travel, visit the sites that they have. That would be a dream road trip for me. Lindsay? I mean, is this like me personally or like with Gritty City or it whatever your either. dream is? Yeah, your dream road trip. If you have two, we can hear both. Um, well, I'd love to drive up to Canada because I haven't been since I was a little kid. Um, so, yeah, I would love to drive way over there and uh, maybe go to Montreal um, or Quebec. Canada has a lot of very beautiful cities, especially if you drive from the Bay Area up through Oregon and Washington. You see yeah. a lot of, I haven't done that trip, but I, I have friends that have done that trip, and they say it's just amazing. Um, I don't know that I would like to be in the car with Gritty City for this long, <laughs> but I would love to take the squad to Chicago to see theater in Chicago. We're yes. great in the car. <laughs> we are. We always have fun. We do do road trips. We rent vans and we go places. So, um, but now, why theater in Chicago? I think it's um, it's not, it's not Broadway like New York, which isn't my cup of tea anyways. I I prefer much more intimate theater. Like I'm not a you know I've been to some huge shows that were really cool, but on the whole, I much more prefer like a 200 seat theater where I'm close to the actors and where I can really see what's going on and I feel much more involved in the show. And I think that like New York, Chicago has a huge amount of theater, but a little bit more interesting in terms of venues and just more intimate theater, but like so much of it, much more than we have in a big area. So. Yeah, that's definitely interesting because I've been to a couple of shows uh, held by the Yugen Theater in San Francisco. And I believe they're one of two um, theaters outside of Japan that focuses on the no style uh, of theater. And it's like the white mask. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And so the audience, I want to say there's maybe, I would guess 60 seats yeah. maybe yeah. at the most. And the front row seat is like two feet away from yeah. where the stage That's is. That's how our theater is. Yeah, and yeah. it's incredible because you get to see all these performers up close and personal. Oh, yeah, you, you get, get the to see sweat and the spit. Yeah. And all of it. Yeah. It's fun until people start throwing paint. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it, like for me, just experiencing that was very unique because it, it's one thing to see movies and big theater performance right. but to see the actual performers that close yeah. and to see them change their emotions and how they're they're so into the role that they're playing yeah. is yeah. very incredible and it, just it's the something detail is facial expression you get when exactly you're it's very unique and the subtlety yeah no i i really like it and i also feel like um because that's the style of theater that we do i think the audience really appreciates the level of intimacy and that you can just 
like we definitely have a range of skill levels you know some of our actors are much more polished and experienced than others you know and that that'll show up in enunciation sometimes it'll show up in just sort of how natural someone is I mean that's real we're training young people we have some 15 year olds you know are they going to be as strong as a 22 year old who's been performing with us for four years no of course they're not but they're good enough yeah. that they're good um I feel like that goes into your casting because I feel like with all your casting like there's certain roles where like you'll cast somebody like Nigeria Black. I don't feel like I could have played the role the same way she played the role. Right. Like, even though, like, I feel like I could have played the role, like, certain people that she picks for certain roles is just perfect because they have a certain something in their personality or the way they talk or the silly way they, or the silly or serious way they, you know, go about their character that just, like, I, I don't think I could have done it the same way you did. You, but you, you would do like, it in your way. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But I think that, that everyone is committed. Like, no one ever breaks character. Like, people are just in it 100%. And people who see our shows talk about the energy and the sweat and the momentum. And I think, you know, when you're that close, you see everything. And, I, you know, I think we get a lot of respect for that. Yeah. But we never talked about your road trips. Yeah, right? tomorrow. Oh, yeah. What's your dream road trip? <laughs> so... I as far as places, I'm not too sure. Like whenever I thought about my dream road trip, it was always the actual vehicle. It was like <laughs> I wanted a giant bus. What car are you in? <laughs> a giant bus, rip out all the seats, and then turn it to like a chill pad. Right. That way, you know, yeah. you drive. Stop. Doesn't even matter. There's where a few right? people that have done like that to school buses. That's yeah, really yeah, that's what amazing. I want to do. School bus, because you know, like living in Oakland, I've seen like this giant school bus when uh, Occupy Oakland was happening, where it was just like they had the curtains up. But, like, instead of having the normal bus door, they had a screen door. And I was like, you can lock that bus? That's the best bus on life. Yeah. So I was like, that's perfect. You know, rip out all the seats. And, like, I've seen, like, different ways you could design it and add a door. I was like, that's the best road trip ever. Like, it doesn't even matter where I end up. I'm living in the best house. But um, just as far as as far as the road can take me, I, I go everywhere and stop everywhere. Sometimes it's the best I haven't road trips are with the people you're with. Not, yeah. Not yeah. Oh, that's that's I, I, I couldn't do a road trip by myself. The best road trip. Yeah. <laughs> I'm kidnapping people if I have to. I'm not road tripping by myself. We do travel quite a bit, though. I mean, we go we go to Oregon every summer for the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, the and Canyon. we go out to the Butteau Canyon um, outside of Pescadero for retreats and the redwoods. And we just got yeah. to see Circus Olay in San Francisco, which is my first Circus Olay. It was amazing. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but you should. Yeah, um, they do a whole bunch of different shows. I went to, um, there was one that they did with horses. Odiseo? <laughs> this one was bikes. So. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so they had different themes. And the one with horses was amazing because they had 122 horses. And it was over in San Francisco. They even flooded the entire stage with a few inches of water wow. so that they could have horses run right through. And I don't know what machinery they had because they sucked, sucked up that water dry so fast for the uh, performance. And they, all that just for maybe five minutes of all these horses running through the water. Must be nice to have that budget. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah, I love that budget. That's the first thing I noticed when we go see any theater at this point. I'm like, oh, my God, the costume. How would they get the stage like that? Oh, my God, I can't even imagine what backstage looks like. Well, I'm going to try and talk about it, too. You know, like, I'll definitely tell them when I get big grants. And, you know, I'll remind them about just, like, what things cost. Because yeah. I don't think, I think it, part of the training is sort of education just around arts administration and, and how to actually, what it takes to operate this yeah. kind of thing and, mm -hmm. and what it actually costs and so that they understand. Although our production values are actually and our budget is actually quite high for a small theater company. We're actually quite competitive. It's mm -hmm. funny when I, you know, when we hire folks and then we tell them what our budgets are for different things, generally they're like, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> so that feels good. You know, certainly it, it didn't start out that way. And so we've, we've grown a lot in the last seven years. I know earlier you were, we got uh, on a tangent, but uh, a good tangent. But you were asking about sort of how many people 
and our growth, you know, and, and when we started out, I think we had like 65 subscribers in our first season, which was actually kind of amazing for a first season, but it was folks who had seen my shows at different high schools and were kind of continuing to support us. But in our, this season, we had 161 subscribers, which is people who pre-bought tickets for wow. both shows. And so that feels pretty great yeah. to have yeah. that number of season subscribers for a youth theater company, like people and people come back year after year. Um, and we sold out our last show. Oh, yeah. You know, so know. fast. So we're, we're hosting, you know, over 1,500 people a year at two shows and doing like $3 student matinees for all Title I high schools and middle schools. And so just introducing a lot of new theater goers to theater because we're affordable, we're accessible, we're culturally relevant, we're this, covering the plays topics we that do matter there. to people. It's all people of color up on stage, mm -hmm. um, as are the vast majority of our uh, wow. designers, our, all, all of our um, uh, guest the person, artists, the and resident who films artists. Because um, Mark D films the yeah. plays. Right, Candé, like mm -hmm. Regina, our board, like we're... Right down to the music. Yeah, Calvin, mm -hmm. like... Yeah. Typically, how many shows do you do for one production? Nine. Okay. So, as uh, performers, does it get easier when you get to the ninth show? Or is it just as hard as the first one? Um, I want to say it, it doesn't get easier because you kind of... Does it, does it I swear it doesn't. Because every show kind of gets treated like the same. Like once we get past it, we're like, oh, we're almost done. So like there's a sense of relief. There's like, okay, after this, we can put these strips away. There's no more blocking, no more quick changes. Yes. Which makes it easier. But I feel like, I mean, besides the dips in like our energy occasionally that Lindsay can notice because she's actually in the audience, I feel like. Mentally, we treat every show the same, which is why I don't think it gets easier. Because every show, we're just like, okay, make sure not to drop your energy. When we're backstage, we're like, make sure not to drop your energy. Hey, um, if you messed this up last time, don't forget that you messed this up. And hey, you didn't set this, or maybe you set that. Like, we're constantly kind of picking at each other just to make sure everything's perfect. Which is why I think it doesn't get any easier or any harder. It's just like neutral. But thoughts. you don't think there's a way in which after you get that first one under your belt and you have a great audience reaction, there's oh, sort yeah. of a breath <laughs> and a relief where you're like, okay, this is a super successful show. Oh, yeah. People love it. So you don't think there's like a boost in confidence going out there after that first night? Oh, yeah. Especially if we have a good, but the only reason why I don't say that is because, you know, because you've been training us so much, or like different, every night with different open audiences. Night. Yeah, yeah. Every no, night's I do night. tell them. I'm like, it's yeah. opening night for this audience. <laughs> they haven't seen. I mean, true. you know, I some do. audiences are different. <laughs> that like some audiences want to be more respectful, so they're more quiet in scenes they don't have to be, or they're more loud in scenes they don't have to be. So you know, we always like try to tell each other like, there's some scenes where people come back. They're like, well, they didn't laugh this time. I'm like, dude, it's okay. Yeah. It's just the audience. You're still great. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. For me, it gets easier. It's just a routine that I built. Like, okay, in this next scene, I have to do this. Um, there's three scenes I'm not going to be in. I'm going to prep some other stuff for the other mm -hmm. uh, actors. And for me, it just got easier. Um, this past show, it was a little bit difficult. I can understand why tomorrow said that. And it was partially my fault because um, two days before opening night, I was dying. <sighs> I was dying. I, I was so sick. sick. I had a sore throat, fever building up. Um, and guess who got I, sick for the rest of the show? So, the first everybody. <laughs> the, the first the opening night, I, I was completely like, you know, green gray, but I still gave it all. The second night, I come in, I'm feeling great. How's everybody? Everyone's dying. I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. It's <laughs> to um, the point where we're backstage and all we hear is, <laughs> <laughs> and they were like, who is that just coughing? Intermission comes and Lindsay's like, I'm so sorry, you guys. I was trying not to die. I'm like, oh, <laughs> thanks, Jordan. Yeah. yeah. Seriously. But it was, a, it was just during that time, it was um, a lot of people that started getting the cold. Even audience members were coughing or like, Backstage, oh, we're not alone. <laughs> but yeah, so I can see why she said it was difficult. Um, just that the sickness, the illness that we had kind of made us um, sluggish. Like, all we had to do a creature was like, uh. You would never see it on stage. No. no one has any idea. You know, and 
we talk about it, you know, what if you're a performer, you go out right. on stage, you do everything, your adrenaline's going to kick mm-hmm. in, it's going to help you, and then you go backstage and die, and that's fine. You can die before, and you can die after, but when you're on stage, you are on stage, and it's a job, you know? I mean, we've literally, I remember a show where a performer was puking. Yeah. We don't have <laughs> understudies. What do you do? We don't have understudies. We had a bucket right by her exit door. What do you do? I mean, I suppose if someone were really incapacitated, you might have to cancel a show or yeah. or someone else the would walk time. on with a script, but it's never happened because honestly, you can rally beyond what you think you can when it's yeah. high stakes. And, you know, you could say, oh, it's just a play or whatever, but I mean, there's a shit ton of people in the audience and they bought tickets mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. it's finite. We can't audience. add a night and there's a whole ensemble, you know, and so people really step up and honest to God, you would not have had any idea that anyone was sick on stage. Yeah. Although I did cough so hard one night in the audience <laughs> that I actually had to like take my heels off and tiptoe out because I was having one of those coughs where it was just like I couldn't stop. And so oh. I went out to the street and just Let it all my out. head <laughs> off for five minutes and then I tiptoed back in like at the right moment. But yeah. Yeah, I think the hardest show we've ever had, which is one where I wasn't a part of the ensemble at the time, was when Lindsay was pregnant for the second time and I think we had there was one ensemble member that just bailed and she had to like step in yeah. her giant yeah. belly yeah. <laughs> no, all these at it's the, the last only minute. time anyone's ever bailed and it was our very first show and she bailed a oh, week and a half the very first it was oh. the very first Goody City show she bailed a week and a half before the show opened and I, it was like well, what else are we gonna do <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so it's the only play I've ever been in <laughs> I was like that was pregnant so when's the next uh uh, play and production schedule. May. We open May 16th with King of the Shrew. And it's uh, Shakespeare, a uh, modern setting. Uh, one family is Nigerian and the other is Argentinian. So you will be seeing some amazing tango sequences. <laughs> uh, really funny, fabulous music. Amazing very, costumes. Very feminist. Um, you know, it's an interesting play very much about male female dynamics and power and gender and we really play with that in a lot of different ways in the show so yeah how can people buy tickets gradycitymap.org yeah there's a big button that says get tickets (laughs) (laughs) yeah they're they won't go on sale until the beginning of april but okay yeah yeah we'll go ahead and link it up on the description and uh, the videos and the podcast link so I want to thank the three of you for coming on to the podcast. It's yeah. very exciting to see what Brady City is doing and really just helping the community. And that's one of the things I love about doing this podcast is really just being able to talk and meet all kinds of different people and what they're really passionate about. So uh, congratulations to Brady City yeah. and uh, good luck. And I will be looking for those tickets when you come on. So. Fabulous. Well, love seeing you in the audience, Rick. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to the podcast. Thank you to our producer, Sam Lemon. Please subscribe, like, comment, and share the podcast. Remember, you can listen to the podcast on iTunes, Podbean, iHeartRadio, Google Play, SoundCloud, and anywhere else you listen to podcasts. For more information on my business as a property manager and real estate team, go visit my website at markguzman.com. I really, really want to thank all of you for listening. It means the world to me, and I hope today's episode provides you value in your day-to-day life. I created this podcast to help showcase the many great people that live in this world and help share some knowledge that I've learned along the way in life. Again, thank you for listening. Check out our sponsors, and I'll catch you on the next episode.